Welcome. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing well. I want to welcome everybody to today's installment of Community Quarantine. Today's guest is none other than Tony Gwynn Jr. Tony, thanks for joining us. How you doing today? I'm well. I'm well. Uh, just getting through it like everybody else right now. Yeah, talk to me about that, man. How's your how's your family? How are you doing in terms of this stay at home measures? Hopefully, everybody is is healthy and safe. Yeah, no, everybody's healthy and safe. Um, I think initially, when we all were put in the stay at home, uh, put under the stay at home orders, um, it was just trying to figure out how it was all going to work. Right, I have four kids, and they're all yeah. they're all different ages, so that means. It's, four different Zoom times for, for distance <laughs> learning. Uh, they all wow. play sports, and their coaches have tried to keep them active in that as well. So trying to balance it that first three weeks was, was chaotic. But I think my wife and I have started to find a groove a little bit. And I, I, I don't think anybody's necessarily happy with the way we have to do it, but I think everybody understands it's necessary. Yeah, from from what I hear, this this the stay at home measures is, is testing people's relationships, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're find you're finding out a lot about your significant other, uh, because listen, I think the one thing that this has made us kind of all of us kind of realize is that we we've been on the hustle and bustle for so long without really taking a deep breath. This has kind of forced us to do that. You know, I I don't have the luxury, or I don't I don't get to go out. Uh, for four hours and be in the office at the studio doing the radio show, I'm doing it from home. So uh, it, it has tested the limits, but you know, me and my wife, we, we love each other, so it's all good. Absolutely. So, so <laughs> how 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 are you managing that with your four kids and you trying to work at home and they know daddy is home? Have you conditioned them to give you your space because your your time slot is a pretty big chunk. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's and it's usually right in the middle of when they're not doing their distance learning. So, uh, I, the three, my three oldest, my three oldest girls, uh, twelve, eleven, and nine, they get it. My four-year-old son, he walks around like he's 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 the king of the house. So he'll open the door even with the "Do Not Disturb" sign I have purchased for the door. He'll still come in and ask me where his iPad is and things, and things of that nature. But for the most part, it, it, it honestly has been relatively uh, easy. Now, with him walking around like he's king of the house, who is he emulating? I don't know because he ain't getting it from <laughs> <Yeah>. me. <laughs> I think uh, I, I, there's no way he's getting it from me. So uh, he's. He, I think what happens with a four-year-old, obviously, is he sees his sister's come in and out, not necessarily knowing the significance of the time they're coming in and out. So right. it's it's uh, it's challenging even for him. I mean, for a four-year-old doing distance learning, it's tough. I mean, it's hard enough when they're in school with other students to keep that age group, you know, focused. Now you're sitting in a house with things that, you know, he, he's very comfortable with, his toys, different things like that. And Getting him to sit down for 30 minutes, 35 minutes while they go through their, their lessons can be tough at times. Understandable. So, so Tony, I, I know that you're, you're a California native. Yeah. But you've lived all over the country because of your career. Since we're talking about your children, are all of your children California natives or have they been born in different states? No, all of them uh, have been born in San Diego. So... Uh, the closest one that had an opportunity that, that that had a chance not to be born here was my middle daughter, Jordan. But it worked out that we were able to get back home. Uh, my wife was able to to give birth with doctors that she was familiar with. It was uh, – it, it, I've been lucky that way. For as much as I've had to move right. around, they pretty much know San Diego as home base. And that's not always the case for uh, people who play the game of baseball. Right, right, right. That's why that's why I asked you. So, sticking with that theme, California native, tell us about your upbringing, your childhood, what what that was like and the influence that your parents had on you as you progressed through grade school, high school. Okay, I would say minus the baseball part, it was right. it was pretty pretty normal. Um I think my mom 
had to pretty much, she had to be mom and dad for six months out of the year with my dad locked in on being the best he could be on the field. Um, what people I think sometimes don't realize is it takes, if you have a family, it takes a, a, a partner that's willing to sacrifice. And right. my mom was, was willing to do that. And she took, you know, raising my sister and I very seriously. Uh, she was tough. She was definitely tough on, on my sister and I, but um, she did such a wonderful job of keeping us grounded. I think, um, you know, when you're, when you're born, you're around a, a baseball lifestyle, obviously financially, there aren't, there's not going to be much, at least in our case that we ever really want it for. Right? right. But, uh, my parents both come from, from Long Beach, California, where they were probably lower middle class growing up. And, one of the most important things I think they ever did was was keep us kind of connected to that so that there was an understanding that this wasn't the norm. And if you didn't put in this, this, the right type of work and you didn't walk a certain type of uh, a lifestyle, you wouldn't have an opportunity to do this type of thing that my right. dad was doing. You know, so I, I think I look back on one of the most important things going having with my mom traveling with my dad during the season. That forced my sister and I most of the time to to spend a lot of times in Long Beach with my grandmother and my uncles and my aunts and you know the, the saying it takes a village. It, takes a village, yeah. it, it, it was no doubt a village in, in our household. So, uh, I, but it was pretty normal. I mean, I didn't start to notice that there was something different about you know our family about my dad and what he was doing until I was probably nine or ten years old. You know, at that point. You're starting to have friends at school that are bringing it up to you. And for a while, it just used to go over my head. Like, I just right. assumed most people, most dads were doing the same thing. Uh, but I, as you get older, you start to realize that's not the case. And it, it took a few really good games and then coming to school the next day and people like just up and kids up in arms about it. that I started to realize, you know, maybe my dad was a little bit different. Were you born in Long Beach? I was, I was. I. So you were born in Long Beach, and and are the Padres what brought you to San Diego? Brought the family to San Diego. So you know, my dad left, or my mom had a uh, a scholarship to UCLA to run track. She was a year older than my father. My father got a chance uh, with a basketball scholarship to come to San Diego State. Now. Right. The only reason why he chose San Diego State, it was one of the only schools that would allow him to play two sports. The other schools he were interested was not they, they wouldn't allow. They, that felt like baseball was a year-round sport. And so he came down to San Diego State, and my mom followed him down here. And from that point on, they were here in San Diego. Now, after my dad left San Diego State, he got drafted and went to the minor leagues. My mom moved back to Long Beach while – my dad was out, and then once he got called up to the big leagues, we've been down here, 80, 1983, uh, we've been down here ever since uh, as a family. So pretty much my dad's, my, my, my dad's entire adult life, uh, he was, he's, been, he's been in San Diego. So what other interests did you have in grade school and high school? Uh, obviously, you got into baseball, but were there any other sports – that you gravitated toward, and were you a good student? And I'll, I'll, and I'll tell you why I'm asking you that question. No, no, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Um, answer the question, yes, I had – my first love was basketball. Um, I didn't really start taking baseball seriously until after my junior year of high school. So I played it, but probably from seventh grade to about my junior year – I was really focused on basketball. I, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to play hoop. And, uh, you know, so I, the time I, I would, I sh probably should have been spending in the profession that I ended up, that time was spent really playing basketball. So I, I went from a kid that was really athletic and the, the game of baseball came easy to me and being sure. ahead of most kids uh, that were my age to focusing on basketball and having all those kids that were below me catch up in baseball because I wasn't putting in the work on that side anymore. 
And that was a that was a little bit of an eye opener for me because, you know, as a kid, it's fun when you're dominating, right? You get to right. it, 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 it's so much it's so much easier when you're dominating. But it wasn't the best feeling to watch kids who I had been dominating through lim- little league all of a sudden be better. And I remember going home after my during my freshman year of high school, telling my dad I didn't want to play baseball anymore. And he convinced me to keep playing. He's like, man, you you've never not had anything to do there in the springtime. You're going to be bored. Just go play. Have fun with it. You know, do what you want after you get done with high school. And it just so happened that kept me in the game long enough for me to start getting better, me to realize that I was talented enough to play it, and also for me to realize that I wasn't going to be 6'3", 6'4", so the hoop thing was going to be a little bit tough for me. What position did you play in basketball? I was a point guard. Point guard. I went. To, okay. I, I, it was. It, 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 and but that was my dad's first love too. So we bonded big time. Probably my dad probably said more about basketball uh, in the early part of my life than he ever said about baseball. And I think it was by design. I think he recognized sharing the same name uh, and playing the same game would would bring challenges. And I think he didn't want me to feel like that was something that he wanted me to do. Like right. base, baseball is one of those games. If you don't love it yourself, there's so much failure in it that it, it won't, it won't be of interest to you if you don't have a true love for the game. So he let me kind of develop that love for my, for the game of my, on my own. Meanwhile, uh, basketball was something that we just both loved to death. So talk to me, Briefly about school, what type of student were you? I wasn't a good student early on. Um, I don't know why. I, I, it just didn't. I did. It didn't register with me that they 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 went together, right? It didn't register with me that sports, especially at the high school and collegiate level, in order to play it at at the highest, you got to be a good student athlete. And I I really really struggled through my freshman and sophomore year. And um, my mom found my savior, I like to call her. Her, her name is Maureen Roadman. Uh, and she was a tutor that really understood for the first time um, how I learned. Somebody took the time to figure out how it was that I was going to learn and how I was able to, to, to remember information. And from that point on, I took off. Now I paid the price for it. Don't get me wrong. I was, when I say I was a bad student as a freshman and sophomore in high school, I was a bad student to the point where my senior year, where most kids are are taking getting a period off because they've taken care of business. I was going to night school. I had to take I had to take three classes after the six I was taking at Poway High. I would leave basketball practice early have to head down to downtown San Diego to, to take these night school classes. And it was tough. I mean, nine classes for a senior in high school was, was tough. But ultimately, um, what happened was I, I, I knew I wanted to play at the next level. I knew I wanted to go to college and have a chance to play at that, at that level. And if I was going to do that, I needed to take these classes and take care of business. And she really, she really changed my path. Uh, in terms of getting into school, like there was prior to meeting her, there, as good as I was at, at basketball and baseball, I I wouldn't have had a chance to go play Division One. So I asked you about the school, Tony, because baseball is a thinking person sport. Yeah. And then you told me that you play point guard. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself. You played a sport that's highly cerebral. You played a position in basketball that's high, highly cerebral. That's why I asked you what was school like for you because you played a sport at the highest level. And to me, most of baseball takes place between your ears. And so I just wanted to know how you were able to tie all these things together together the point guard, baseball, and, and academics because it was necessary for you to have your your, your mind right to play yeah. baseball. Once, once Maureen opened that door to how it was I needed to learn, because I, I don't, as you mentioned, 
all those things are sports. So I get a chance to see it happening. And that's how I, I learned, you know, and sometimes when you're dealing with, with school, depending on your teacher and depending on how they teach, that may not be how the class is taught. And right. a, a lot of times that would get me in trouble and I would just shut down. I wouldn't ask for help like I should have. I wouldn't do none of that thing, none of those things. So uh, once she unlocked that and I started to see there were parallels between the sports, how I was learning in each of the sports I was playing and how I needed to learn in, in school. Once I figured that part out, school became a lot easier for me. That, that makes sense. So your father obviously is Hall of Fame baseball player. Your mother was a track star. You went on to become a major league baseball player and your sister is a recording artist. Yeah, yeah. Was your household competitive? That's a lot. To me, that's a lot of egos <laughs> in this, <laughs> under, under the same yeah. roof. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was competitive. It was. Thinking back on it, and it was competitive in, in different things, you know, whether it was if we're outside talking trash on the, on the basketball court, whether it was on the tennis court, whatever we were doing in terms of competition, it was always competitive. And it didn't just stop with my parents. I mean, my your mom, uncle, your uncle right, too. My, my my uncles. My dad had two brothers that were, were extremely talented athletes. Uh, my mom has five brothers and two sisters. So, wow. you know, when when my mom was gone, their competitiveness was around. So, it, it we were always competing at different things, but uh, there was also a lot of love in the house, regardless of what was going on competitively. Uh, we could all be able to, to move past it wasn't any grudges held too long you know when somebody right. lost a, 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 or or they ended up on the wrong side of a discussion I mean but uh that's kind of what our family was how our family was was what it was about everybody joining us I'm I'm, I'm speaking with Tony Gwynn Jr shout out to Michael Pittman shout out to Stevie shout out to my mom my mom wanted to tune in and, and, and see what you were all about <laughs> Tony so so it's obvious the relationship, the closeness that you had with your, your father, same sport. But yeah. what I was really touched by was when I discovered that your sister's debut album, she titled 19 after your father. That really touched me. Explain to me the, the impact that your father would have on your sister to compel her to name her debut album basically after her father? I mean, if you just look at it from my sister's standpoint, right? Um, she has an older brother who has the same name as her father. They're both kind of making their own way. But my dad never made it feel like that. You know, he, he was always very cognizant of what was going on with my sister. Because it's very easy as as men that have sons right. to 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 put your focus on them and forget about your daughter. Uh, that wasn't an option for me because I had three girls first, so I had to. I, I was right. a girl dad before I became a boy dad. Uh, but for my dad, uh, he he just had this way about him that even though he wasn't around as much during that baseball season he didn't make us feel like that. And that wasn't just for me. That was for my sister as well. And I think um, as I moved out of the house and it was just my sister there, their bond became a lot tighter. You know, they, it, it, she was also around uh, a lot more when my dad got sick, you know, so uh, their relationship as close as my dad and I's relationship is uh, or was, her relationship was was on that same level. That's beautiful to hear. I, I really was curious about that. So you're in you're at Poway High School. You get drafted by the Braves straight out of high school. Yeah. And and you don't go. Yeah. Take us through that decision making process, Tony. That was fun because it, it was really the first time I got my, got to really see my dad as a parent. Right. He'd been a parent before, but now people in his world are coming into his house, not for him, 
but for his son. And to watch him mm. and how, you know, he viewed it, it was always interesting to me. I knew from the moment that that was a possibility that I probably wasn't going to sign um, without even having a discussion with my dad. The luxury of being around the game so long, if you're honest with yourself, it gives you a true evaluation uh, of where you are. Um, I knew from a physical standpoint, I mean, I was 5'10", 5'9", maybe even shorter than that. I was like 140 pounds. And I had never been out of my parents' house for longer than a weekend. <laughs> so wow. was how was I going to sign? Because, you know, the luxury of having a dad that played is I get to know what it's like as a minor leaguer when you first start out. And I didn't. I knew from a mental standpoint, from a physical standpoint, I probably wasn't ready. And despite them offering a, a significant amount of money, which wasn't a, necessarily a problem for me, I, I grew up Tony Gwynn's son, who you know was doing pretty well in the game of baseball. Um, I just knew that I certainly didn't want to take this team's money, knowing that I wasn't ready to go out and perform. And more importantly, if I wanted, if I was ready. I would I would have gone out, but I just knew physically, mentally, I wasn't I wasn't on I wasn't on par to go out there. I would have ended up back home <laughs> sooner rather than later if I'd have left out of high school. Well, that's that's the complete opposite of today's athlete. You you looked in the mirror and was honest with yourself and didn't yeah. o- didn't have an overinflated opinion of yourself. Most people take that leap. Finances are first and foremost on their mind, and they're not ready. They spend a couple of years in whatever league and they flame out. Right. And, and, and listen, don't get me wrong. I was blessed enough for the financial part to be out of the, 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 the options in terms of what I was looking at if I wanted to go play. I, I, right. That wasn't an issue for me. So, you know, I understand a lot of guys who are less fortunate, don't have the means, looking to support their family. That, that has to weigh on you, right? But right. I didn't have that that hanging over my head so it was easy for me to see it clearly listen do you want to play at the big league level is this the best route for you to get to the big league level for me it wasn't so you're at san diego state aztecs for life by the way that's right that's right so what was your san diego state experience oh my gosh i love that place like it, it it's where i grew up it's pretty much where i became a man I learned how to be on my own, and it, it honestly prepared me for the next step, which was that step I wasn't ready for out of high right. school. It prepared me to be able to go out and live on my own and be okay about it. Um, my three years there were were awesome. Um, my freshman year, obviously, you walk on the campus, and it, it's it's a little bit of a shock. You know, you're you you're, you're on your own. You're making your right. own decisions, and uh, again, it, it's funny how it all lined up. Meeting uh, Maureen, who was my tutor in high school, and having her for those two years in high school also prepared me academically to handle college. And I was a much better college student than I was a high school student. And um, it, it, those times I look back, if, if there's a specific time in my life that I wouldn't mind going back to revisit, Certainly, that would that would be the time. <laughs> <laughs> we we're gonna keep it we're gonna keep it PG, Tony. <laughs> well, we're, we're probably not even not even on that level. It's just I learned I learned so much about being an adult at that point. You know, I had been under my parents' roof. I was relatively sheltered uh, growing up. You know, so having the experiences of being out on your own are are something to me that prepared me to where I'm at today with, with my own family. So, uh, and from a baseball standpoint, that's where I started to get my legs underneath me. You know, I, I was in- introduced to the weight room. All of a sudden you're seeing upperclassmen that are in there and uh, you see them in the weight room, but then you see them after the, the time that you're supposed to be, they're still in there working. And so, you know, the best thing you can have as an athlete really as an individual is curiosity. So mm-hmm. your curiosity uh, kind of peaks up and you're like, well, why is he staying after? What's he doing? You know, so now I'm watching uh, a guy like Sean Pierce, who was on my team, a senior, who, who's getting an extra footwork 
working on the ladder, working on his brakes. I was like, I, I, I want to do that. I, I want to get better. And so, you know, from freshman year to sophomore year to junior year, you start building on that. Uh, and you hope that the idea is that you hope that when you get to the point where you're eligible to be drafted and a team wants to take you, that you're a hundred percent ready without any questioning of it. So you, you go through San Diego state, you're in the minors and compared to the major leagues, I would imagine that the minor league is a lot more blue, blue class, uh, blue collar, middle class. You're, you're, it's, it's, it's a grind compared to major league baseball. You broke into the majors the same year you got married. Yes. Tell me about that year, 2006. Same year you get married, the same year you break into the majors. It must, must be a watershed year in your life. It, it was. It truly was. I think um, that at that point, everything kind of started coming together for me baseball-wise. Um, the two previous years, 04, 05, were really tough, right? Because my first full season, and you know, you sign two thousand three. You only are there from for me. It was June to August, so it was two months. wasn't that big a deal to me. Um, but my first full season in '04, I struggled, and it was the first time I'd ever struggled in the game of baseball. Like even when I was going back to the high school, even when I was saying that people were catching me, it wasn't like I was terrible. It was just people were were a little bit better. Right. And so and so now I'm like really struggling. I I think I hit 242. First time I've hit below 280 in my life. And the previous time was before that was the first year I got drafted, which is looked at as pretty good. So I'm struggling. I'm playing every day. I'm living by myself. Uh, and it and it really wore on me. So oh, by the time we get to 06. Uh, things are starting to come together. Like I, I had to repeat the double A year after 04. I had to go back in 05. I took care of business. And going into 06, you know, the the Brewers are starting to make their way to being relevant again. They have a, a, a boatload of young talent at the at the triple A and double A level. And it's it, and at this point going in 06, I don't know where I'm gonna be. I don't know if I'm going back to triple A. I don't know if I'm gonna get a chance at uh I don't know if I'm back to double A. I don't know if I'm going to get a chance to go to triple A. And there was another center fielder that was already at the triple A level that was highly regarded. So I'm going in to this spring training in 06, not really knowing what's, what's going to happen. I have a good spring. I go to triple A. I don't even know if I'm going to start. You know, I don't know if I'm going to play left or right. I've never played any other place in center at this point. Uh, so, that year starts, and I get off to a terrific start. And from there, it just kind of was like a, it's like a snowball rolling downhill. It, it just kind of picked up speed, and uh, it just so happened, I think Brady Clark, who was at the big league level at the time, right. was, str- was struggling a little bit. And so come July, right after the, the All-Star break, I get that phone call um, about going – if I, about going to – and I missed the first phone call, like, it was, it was, I'm in, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Nashville. So it's probably seven in the morning and the, my phone rings. I'm, I, I'm, I'm 24 at the time, 25. I'm not thinking about answering that phone. And uh, it just so happens after I woke up and saw the missed call, it was from my manager. So I knew I needed to call back at that point. Uh, he let me know I was going to big leagues and uh, it was a surreal moment. If I'm not mistaken, I think the same day, I, um, the same day I got the call up is the same day I proposed to my wife. Get out of here, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's storybook was, stuff, Tony. That's storybook it, stuff. It was, it was a watershed moment. It also was this, at the same time I started realizing I was good enough to play at the big league level. So it all kind of came together in that 2006 year. Who was your first phone call after you received the phone call that you were getting called up? Who'd you call first? It, it was to my parents. I knew my dad wouldn't be up at that point, uh, back two hours behind us in, in San Diego. But I knew my mom would be up. So I called her. Uh, and my mom was a cool character. She, you know, she, I told her, I know she was excited, but she was like, oh, that's, that's she nice. Played she, she, played she played it off. She played it off. Yeah, she 100% <laughs> played it off. 
And um, I think she then, after we hung up, she woke my dad up, told him, he called. He was much, he had a much harder time containing his his excitement for oh, it. Oh, that's great, man. And so uh, I hopped on the plane and headed to Arizona. My dad, who hates flying, decided he was going to drive, not even knowing if I was going to get in that bat that day or or even be in the game. D- didn't matter. It didn't, didn't matter. matter. It didn't matter. He drove in, uh, and it just so happened he got to see the, my first at bat that same day. That's fantastic. So I, I, I have a confession. What you got? It's, it's 2007. I'm watching the Brewers play the Padres. <laughs> I know where this is going. Okay. You step into the batter's box. And it wasn't until you stepped into the batter's box and I got a good look at your face that I realized that you were Tony Gwynn's son. Do you remember where we met? We met in the weight room while Coach Oten was taking you and other minor league baseball players through – weight training, the conditioning, and what stood out to me when you and I met was your sense of humor. You ripped me for being a Knicks fan. Every time you saw me, (laughs) every time we saw each other, there was this back and forth between the two of us about the Knicks and their trash, and you weren't mean-spirited about it. You, It was enough to make me laugh, and I really had an affection for you. You introduced yourself to me as Anthony. Yeah. And truth be told, when I was going to the weight room, sometimes I would wonder if you would be there. So I, I would I would have to get prepared for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, and, and I, you were really somebody. And this is rare. I meet a lot of people. Tony It's rare that you meet somebody and you like them right away. Yeah. I see you in the battery box. and I'm like, I'm not going to use the, the, the language. I said, oh, <laughs> that, that's Tony <laughs> Gwynch this whole time. <laughs> This this character has been giving me grief, and it says a lot about you as a person. You're a beautiful person, and your parents have to be so proud of you, not not the career that you have, but the person that you are. Yeah. And so I'm watching you for the first time, now knowing who you are, and you set off a domino effect of, <laughs> of ripping the hearts out of Padres fans yeah. Forever. Yeah. Take me through the aftermath of that triple that you hit that kept the Padres from clinching that playoff spot. What did people say to you afterwards, basically being a hometown kid and coming home and putting another dagger in yeah. the hearts of, of, of the Padres? First and foremost, thank you for the kind words. Uh, rest in peace to Coach Oden because I know he passed away not too yes. long ago. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I learned a lot from that man. I really did. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, that's that's something that I think my mom and dad installed in my sister and I pretty early. Um, I, I didn't having the same name as a guy who is who is beloved as my father, puts you in weird part, puts you in weird kind of a weird space when you're meeting people for the first time. So a lot of times when I said Anthony, it was because I didn't want to get into who my father was. And it's not because I was embarrassed or anything like that. You just want people to to know you genuinely for you first. Mission accomplished. Mission, oh, this, <laughs> mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. So um, fast forward into to that game. It, it, it was it was a big moment for me. It was like, it, first of all, it's probably one of the biggest moments of my career. I'm, I'm facing a guy that I literally grew up in a locker room with him not too long, not too far away from my dad's locker room, <laughs> right. Trevor Hoffman. I mean, right. this guy is like an uncle to me, basically. Um, and, <laughs> hey, Tony, sorry, Unc. <laughs> I mean, listen, I would do it to my blood uncle the same right. way. So, right. I mean, it, 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 it's at the end of the day, I had a job to do, but Again, being around him and, you know, one of my, my dad, one of his biggest pet peeves was to come to the stadium for me as a child and not pay attention to what was going on around me. So all those times I had heard Hell's Bells and paid attention to what Trevor, how he got down, what he was throwing, uh, all of that helped. Now, I'm on the I, – I don't know I'm even hitting that in. I'm coming up it, at this time – 
we had just been eliminated the night before from playoff contention. So, again, as I told you, the, Brewers, right. the yeah. Brewers hadn't been to the playoffs since 1982 at that point. So this was a big series, even though the Padres held their own destiny in their hand. For us, we had to sweep to have a chance to stay in the playoffs. They beat us the first game, so that wasn't uh, a possibility. But the second game, I came into that game kind of disappointed because I thought, okay, we've been eliminated. Maybe I'll get a start. You know, we can't we can't get to the playoffs no more. Maybe I get a chance, an opportunity to start. And so when I walked into the clubhouse that day, I didn't see my name in the lineup. I was I was a little upset. I was, we right. had two games left in the season. Uh, I had done a pretty good job as in my second year coming up. You know, doing different things for the team. I thought, okay, maybe I get an opportunity. What didn't happen? I was a little disappointed. So I had to kind of go through that through the first three, four innings, and then you start locking in on your job. You know. There's an opportunity that I'm have to pinch it. I need to be ready. Um, and so when Ned Yost came to me, it was like, hey, you're going to hit this inning. Um, I started getting my mind right. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, I had paid attention to what I think Trevor had thrown maybe 12 straight change-ups prior to my at-bat. So I'm going up there knowing I've seen this change-up probably more than anybody else in this building right now. Mm. And – I also have my dad's voice in ringing in my head, son, stay on the fastball, adjust down to everything else. So we get into the at-bat, he throws me a changeup, I take it, he throws me another one, I swing over it, he throws me another one, I foul it off. So now it's one, two, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, he's now thrown, what, 14 straight change-ups, I need to be able to stay back, but I can't get beat by the fastball, and it's just, right. that's just a no-no. And uh, he threw the chains up. He left it up just enough for me to get the barrel there. And I flipped it down the right field line, and I slide in the third. And as I slide head first in the third, I already know at this point that my ride home is the Moores family, who owned the Padres at this time. <laughs> so when I slide into third base – my That's what you're thinking about? No, well, I, I, I just happen to make – I just happen to see them as I slide. And I <laughs> – Emotion as I come up, I'm pumped up. We just tied right. the game in the bottom of the ninth. <laughs> and so I give a fist pump and I just happen to make eye contact with John. And the look on his face was just like I You walk it. You walk it, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And so when, That's when, a the, fantastic when, when that series ends, I got to get on the plane. And they're still, and so at this point now, the series ends. They're flying home so that they can fly to Colorado for the one game playoff. Right. And the whole ride home, I, I, I just stayed in my little corner. Nobody said a word to me. <laughs> <laughs> I made I made sure I slept as much of the flight as I could. Oh man. But it was all love. I think when I got home, I was living in I was living in PB at the time. It was just me and my wife. And walking around the city was tough for like the first couple of days. It really was. Like there were people who were genuinely upset with me. Like, can't believe you did that. Right, can't right. Believe, can't believe you did that to your home team. I was like, it's not my home team no more. I'm paid <laughs> by the Brewers to do a job. Uh, but, you know, after a few days, you know, I think everybody got over it and everybody was cool. I, I, didn't, I, I still catch flack every now and then about it, me ruining the Padres' hopes for a playoff spot. But for the most part, it's, it's been all love. Hey man, that's a that's that's a that's a big pile of people that have ruined Padres playoff spot. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't be taking it out on you. That's what I you see. know. So that's a great story. I'm so glad I asked you that question, man. Uh, so due to time constraints, you spend all this time playing baseball at the highest level, and you transition into to television. Yeah. What was harder for you to prepare for? I mean, you're getting into this new. You said baseball came natural to you. Yeah. Did broadcasting come natural to you? No. <laughs> the 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 structure of broadcast. I mean, there's a there's a there's a structure to it. You know, and as as the analyst or the the color guy, you are really talking about what happens on the game but it can't be while you're stepping on the play-by-play -play guy so that mm -hmm. has taken some time to learn and that's just on the radio side on the tv side when i'm doing pre and post 
getting used to to how to get your change your camera look without making it awkward. I mean, some of that stuff, and, and you're in a specific time frame, right? You get a certain amount of time when you're on the air. When when Mike Pomeranz throws it to me, I got maybe 45 seconds, a minute to say whatever it is I need to say. That was difficult. Talking about baseball is, I mean, I can do that any day of the week. I do that literally all the time. Even when I'm not working, I talk, I, I love the game that much. So the talking part is easy. The structured part has taken some, some time to learn. And fortunately, as uh, for me, as a person who watched a lot of baseball as a kid, even as a kid, one of the things I always tended to focus on was who was broadcasting the game, whether it was Ted Leitner, whether right. it was Jerry Coleman, whether it was Vin Scully. Right. I was always, as a kid, playing in the living room, I'm broadcasting my own game. So, of course you are. We all did. No, no, right? no matter the sport, right? No, no matter what the sport was. So uh, those things, uh, the transition itself wasn't difficult, but learning the little nuances ha has taken some work. And what, what's the most gratifying part of, of broadcasting for you? The relationships. You know, and it's kind of similar to the game of playing in the game itself. I mean, yes, do I miss competing, putting, you know, putting the cleats on, getting the union? Absolutely, 100% miss that. But I miss more the camaraderie that you get in the clubhouse. Like for right. you, when you're ragging on your teammate, you're ragging on your friend, those things are fun and they're therapeutic, honestly. And I enjoy the same thing with our team, you know, at Fox and, and, you know, for the Padres broadcast team, it's it's the same type of banter, you know, I had in the locker room. So it, it actually uh, it's one of the more gratifying things is to, to kind of cultivate those relationships. And, you know, somebody goes, somebody needs something. You know, I need something. I know I can always call on those guys. So. From a broadcasting standpoint, you, you're still watching as much baseball as, as you ever have in your life. You spent your life playing baseball. I stopped playing baseball at a young age, and I'll tell you why. I just could not feel comfortable with the anxiety of being uh, in that batter's box, right? Yeah. Uh, take me through the psychology of a baseball player. I didn't like the failure in baseball. Yeah, I felt like every time I got up to, to bat, I should have gotten a hit. And when I didn't get a hit, it, 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 it stayed with me. Yeah. If I struck out, that was even worse. Yeah. How do you make a career putting yourself in a position day in and day out where you are failing so much and yet you keep coming back for more? Again, that's where the love has to be of the game has to be so strong that it doesn't deter you. Uh, it's hard to get your mind wrapped around failing 70% of the time. And that's if you are at the, the top of the game. You know what <laughs> right. I'm saying? Most, right. of the, most of us, you're failing 75, 76, maybe maybe 74% uh, percent of the time. But that's where the, the range is for most guys, right? And when you think of it from that standpoint and you're going through it, it's, it's hard. Even for a guy like myself who, who played eight years, that anxiety is, is real. Like you feel that now the really good ones have short memories. You make it out. So what? I'll get a hit the next time. And that's what the really good players in the league are really successful at. And no matter, they could be over their last 20 in their mind. They're going 20 for their next 20. And there's not anybody in the way. Levels to that where, um, you know, different guys can, can take that to a different level. And I think that's why you have the difference between your superstars, your really good players, your, your, your average players, and your below average players. They can do all of those things, but just different levels. So no matter the player, anybody who's stepping into that batter's box has that, that, that sense of anxiety. Oh, I think so. And, and you know what? Some of the time, I think that's once you settle into it, you know, and, and there's guys who can embrace it better than, than others. And the guys that can embrace it have success for an extended period of time. 
But eventually, either your body starts to fail you or your mind starts to fail you. Honestly, that's usually when you start to see guys kind of fall off, when either their body has betrayed them and said, I've had enough, or their mind is like, I can no longer take that anxiety and change it into something that's, that's productive for me. I couldn't hang. <laughs> I just, I, I, did, I, I couldn't hang. And, you know, I told you I wanted to talk to you about the, the disappearance of the African-American baseball yeah. player in Major League Baseball. And I personally think that failure, that high fail rate is part of the reason why African-American athletes gravitate more toward basketball and football because I think there's more success and there's more instinct gratification. That's just a theory that I have, but I wanted to throw that to you and get your thoughts on why you think that the numbers are so low in Major League Baseball in terms of athletes, African-American athletes deciding to go play different sports. I think there's so many variables to it. One of them being what you mentioned, right? When you turn on the TV, you don't see Mookie Betts as much as you see Steph Curry. Right. You know, you don't see um, – baseball's got to find – and it's not just baseball because they got to be able – they got to have two partners in it, right? If baseball wants to be able to put faces on, you got to have guys who are willing to be the face. And not all, everybody's cut out to be that, and that's okay. But in, in terms of – of why I think, as you mentioned, the instant gratification part, I think is real minor leagues. You got to grind and, and, and let's be honest, baseball, the skill part of it is the toughest thing to do in all sports. Yep. Being able to hit a round ball with a round bat. I don't care who you are. It is the toughest thing to do. And if you're not, if you don't have that skill, you probably aren't going to gravitate to this game. The other thing is uh, economics. Baseball is right. expensive. You know, playing for the, and the way base, especially youth baseball has gone now. I mean, travel ball teams uh, are, are where it's at, and you got to be in the right area to be on a good one. Then right. there's there's so many variables that go into I believe why African American. I think back to that era that my dad grew up that played yep. in, and the group in the era that he grew up watching. I mean. The constant in all of those is you had a bunch of dads taking their sons out, teaching them about the game, playing catch. And it's just those little things early on that you got to plant. Baseball is not a sport that you're likely going to love if you've waited too long to introduce it, to be introduced to it. It's <laughs> right, just right. not. So I think um, we got to get our dads, our, our, our African-American dads, to introduce the game at an early age at a very early age and stick with it, stick with that game because it, it, kids are going to gravitate a lot to what their parents believe right. in, what they see. And if we got parents that are, that are, you know, giving them the game, uh, showing them the game of baseball and letting them know, listen, yeah, they fail 70, you fail 75% of the time, but it's a beautiful game. If you learn to play it, if you learn to love it, um, Right now, we just don't have enough of those things. A lot of those variables I talked about are in play right now. Economics, basketball is, and football are, are sports that are at their peak. And, you know, that's probably it has to do with it, too. At that time, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, basketball was just coming into its own in the 90s. Basketball was having its problems. It, it was in the 80s. It, right. right. Until Magic and Bird came along, basketball right. was having a lot of problems. So The NFL, too. The NFL, NFL, too. NFL, too. And so baseball – was it was easy to 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 point your kids towards baseball at that point. You didn't right. want them to be associated with those other leagues. But now, to Great the point. credit of the NBA and NFL, they've raised their level, and baseball's got to find a way to keep up. Because right now, you know, there just aren't enough African American faces that kids can relate to in in the African American community. Well, think think about this. Think about what Deion Sanders did. I can't see that happening now. Even Brian Jordan oh, did that when he was playing when he was playing for the Falcons. I would I would be shocked to see an NFL player stick with baseball long enough that he was good enough to go and play in Major League Baseball. What what, what happened with Kyler Murray? I mean, it's number ten pick overall with the right. A's. 
all of a sudden, and he was sold on baseball. All of a sudden, he number one pick in the NFL could be it could be the number one pick in the NFL and changes his mind. And that's a kid who who was a good baseball player. Went to Oklahoma, played there. Right. Loved the game of baseball. Still loves the game of baseball. But it's 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 a different world now. And 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 when I say that there's not they don't have enough faces, there's a plenty of African American baseball players that that kids can watch. There are some right. some absolute ballers out there. But we don't necessarily see them on in the commercial. We don't see them enough. We don't hear from them enough. And uh, I don't know who's in the falter if, if Major League Baseball's not doing enough to, to get those faces out there. But when I was growing up, I can I can remember seeing Griffey. I can remember seeing right. Bonds. I can remember seeing different uh, Dave Stewart, Ricky Henderson. Right. Like, I remember seeing those guys. They made me want to play. You know, as long as obviously I had my dad. No, no, you're, too, you're, but, you're right. You're right about that. But Tony. those guys were visible to everybody. Yeah, because I grew up on the East Coast in the tri-state area watching the Yankees, Willie Randolph, Mickey Rivers, Reggie right. Jackson, Chris right. Chambliss. And to your point, it made me want to play. I wanted to go to Yankees bat day and cross my fingers that I got a Reggie Jackson bat. You, you, I, I, I'm, right, I'm right there with you. Uh, I, I never thought about that piece that you talked about as it relates to where the NBA and where the NFL was in the 70s and, and early 80s compared to baseball. Baseball was our nation's pastime. It, it was. It was. I mean, we're learning a lot about we're, if we've been paying attention to, to ESPN and stuff since we've been in this stay at home. You've learned. I've learned a lot about where the NBA was at that right. point. Like it wasn't necessarily looked at as the league that it is now. Neither was the NFL. Baseball was in that spot. You know they they've been playing these eighty four. They played the, the eighty four series last night when the Padres played the Cubs, right. and it's amazing right. to see how many African American players are on the on one team, let alone on the field itself. So right. it was just, it's a different time now. And I just think baseball has to find a way to keep up with the, with, with what NBA and the NFL are doing. If they want to raise that number, I think it's 9%, 8%, something like something crazy low right. at, at, the, at the major league level. It might even be lower than that. If they want to raise that, that number, they're going to have to try to do things a little bit differently. I hear you. I hear you. So, we're, our time is waning, Tony. I know that we've spoken primarily about what you've done on the field and your transition into broadcasting. I want to give you the opportunity to share what you do on your, in your personal time as it relates to giving back to the community and the community work that you do uh, with your mom or on your own, what you have your family doing as well. Yeah, my sister, myself, my mom just started uh, the Legacy Foundation, where we're going to try to reach kids through sports. And um, it's open to everybody, but we particularly are looking out for the underserved kids in the community. Uh, not just the community I live in, but really down south, you know, all around San Diego County. Uh, so we're getting that off the ground. We kind of have, have linked win baseball, my, my travel ball teams through it. Uh, it's something that we focus on a lot. Um, that's just now starting to get off the ground. The uh, I have a couple other uh, great organizations that I work with. Paving Great Futures is one of them. Uh, they do some some really good work. As a matter of fact, they're doing a, a COVID nineteen uh, emergency kind of food a food drive, food relief. Um, they're doing that at, uh, off on four hundred four in Euclid Ave every Tuesday oh, four it. four p.m. Uh, you can drive up, you can walk up, you can pick, you can take it out. Um, that's something that uh, that group, that Paving Great Futures group with with uh, with Jay and Barry and, and, and Armand, they've done a great job really serving the community. It, I, it's something I really believe in. They got some really great programs. And the other one organization I'm working with is, is, is uh, Computer to Kids San Diego. Uh, they do what they do is kids that don't have computers and in today's age, wow. you really yeah. can't you really can't advance academically without one. They're a type of they're an organization that helps get computers to kids that don't have them, not even just kids, but maybe schools that don't have a lot of computers. They 
they refurbish them from old companies that that don't use the computers anymore and they try to get them out um those are those are the two that i i, I really am focused on right now and um you, you you know it's something that i think especially now with with kids not in school uh and, and really needing computers uh it, it's one of the organizations that i think has been very uh positive in this particular moment in life for all of us. Well, I'm not surprised, Tony. As, as I said to you from the time we met until now, uh, you're a, a wonderful human being. And I know that a lot of times people stop you and want to talk to you about your dad. But in your own right, the person that you've become, you're a great role model for your own kids. You're a great role model for other people's children. And uh, I'm I'm blessed to know you, man. I want to thank you for taking the time out to to share a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are. Uh, can't thank you enough, Tony. John, I appreciate the time, man. Thanks for having me on. And uh, just keep keep doing your thing, man. You're doing some, some pretty spectacular stuff yourself. I appreciate it, man. You take care. Stay safe. All right, you too. All right, Tony.